All right, guys. Welcome back. EYL. We are back in Gotham City. Another one. Yes. Another one. Um, this is going to be a fun episode. I've met two of the gentlemen. I haven't met the third gentleman until today. So, David. Yes. Pleasure to meet you. Pleasure to meet you, too. I appreciate it. So, um, Mike Novogratz, he's actually been on Market Mondays. Indeed. If you're an avid Market Mondays, you remember that? I remember. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so do we. Yes. Yes. Apparently uh, some publications loved it. Yeah, for sure. Did you see what happened with that? No. Business Inside and all these things? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? Yeah. He was talking about XRP. Yeah. I seem to put my foot in my mouth every time, yeah, I, open, yeah, every yeah. time I open it. I was like, wait, we made it to Business Insider. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Funny. That was good. But thanks, it was good. Thanks, Mike. Good content. Uh, I got some death threats out of that thing. So. <laughs> <laughs> in Best Fest, in his Best Fest stage. Yes. Touch that. Yes. Um, and we got Mel Carter. Mel is somebody that we met in Abu Dhabi. Kicked it with. Good guy. Very good connector of energy. Yes. Um, got some mutual acquaintances. Absolutely. Quite a few. Sh shout out to our boy, Larry. Shout out to Larry. Larry Monroe. Larry Morrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great guy. The dog. And uh, David Berry to round out the trio. Yes. So <laughs> this is a unique group of eclectic individuals that have come together to create a powerhouse podcast that you are going to display very soon. Very, very soon. Business Untitled. Business, <laughs> business Untitled. So uh, this is going to be a dope conversation. I want to talk about each one of you guys individually and the show and your mindset on business and investing and a variety of different things. But First and foremost, thank you for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you for you having us. Welcome sorry, to the sorry, show. sorry, sorry, we made you wait. That's all right. No. It's only forty-five minutes, but it's fine. <laughs> 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 this guy smells good. This guy smells good. <laughs> yeah, you're supposed to be on our side, bro. Come on, bro. You're supposed to. Trinity, you know? come on. That's why I didn't Trinity see it was an hour. Trinity, <laughs> fine. All right. So, how did you guys come together? First and foremost, how, how did how does this group? actually happen because you're all you're different ages right i yeah, think that's yeah. the first denominator <laughs> yeah. amongst, amongst other things so yeah, how, how do you guys come together and actually form a friendship and then a business high level uh we met at a party mike asked to see my watch which was like a really is a richard mele took my watch left for like three days took your watch yeah like off your watch. wrist like yeah like oh, let me see this and, and never just, came back? It was that watch right there. You're right. No, it wasn't this watch. No. It was the one you forced me to sell two years ago that I made a shit ton of money on. <laughs> but um, good trade. But um, took my watch and I was like, the guy I just met left with my watch. <laughs> and everybody was like, oh, don't worry. He's a billionaire. Like, he's he'll a, be fine. And I'm like, a billionaire. That's what the fuck it. does that have to do with him even with my watch? <laughs> And I legit didn't hear from him for like three days. And at the time, it's like my most valuable possession. It's like 140 grand at the time. I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> and then one day I get a call from him like three days later, like, hey, come pick up the watch. And he invited me to his house. And uh, I walked to the door and it was like, uh, it's old building, bank downstairs. And I remember thinking, this is where a billionaire lives? This is so weird. <laughs> and I walked in the house and it was definitely a billionaire's fucking house. <laughs> he gave back my watch, showed me around his billionaire house and couldn't, can't get rid of him ever since. That was right. five years Th ago. That's crazy. So like, was that a test or did you just like randomly <laughs> no, 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 leave no. with I, the watch? I, there was more involved. I, like I was hanging out with him. Meek was there. Yeah. Uh, Meek's friends. The weed they smoke is a lot stronger than the weed I was used to smoking. And so I was at a bar. I didn't know where I was. I, was I don't like, smoke. I'm Irish actioning. And so, you know, these guys had me smoking the chronic. I went home. <laughs> Jesus, I got a chain. I got a watch. I believe, what the hell happened? So last you just night? got, it's like, because you got hot. It's like Afro that. man. Because I got hot. This? Oh, what, what, part, <laughs> what party was it? It was a, uh, I think it was a kickoff party for the Mike Reform Rubens. Um, Rubens, like Rubens, party. Rubens housewarming. Yeah, maybe. housewarming Mike party. Rubens yeah. party. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because a usual typical party if somebody takes your watch, that's not something that's welcomed. But when oh no, I was running around looking for him. When all a billionaire, night. is it like that? Okay. <laughs> I, I was saying, this is I, I was oh, you. So you felt the way about it. I didn't. You feel were concerned. Way. I you felt the way when he disappeared. Were you concerned? 
Yes. And that's what everyone <laughs> kept telling me. Don't be concerned. Did you, he's a you billionaire. His, how'd you get his number? Or how'd he get your number? I don't even think I had his number. And he called. He came by. It was very nice. And then we met again at the Super Bowl. Yeah. Uh, and that's when we really So went. you just got so high, you didn't you didn't know what you was doing. You didn't know you didn't know he was taking his watch. You didn't realize in that I, moment. I probably don't remember. Uh, <laughs> I had the watch. I had the chain. I was like, I guys got to go home, guys. And no one said anything. So I just went home. <laughs> then I was like, oh, man. <laughs> yeah, I had a full-on panic, scrambling, yeah. looking for this guy in the park. And then you guys been rocking ever since? We met in Super Bowl like a few months later, and that's when we really, one of his brothers, uh, you could tell that story. Yeah, when down there were supposed to be me and my three brothers, and one couldn't come, and so we had an empty spot, and Mel was staying at the same hotel. And so we were like, you want to hang? And he just kind of hung with us, and man, baby was everywhere at that thing. We just kept, <laughs> I was like, who is baby? The guy is everywhere. And that became a joke, and yeah. he just started to, having fun and i haven't been able to shake him since all right so now now dave how, how did you come into this mix because i don't you don't pair as a type that's going to leave with a chain or a watch <laughs> <laughs> he's a lot cool. I'm I'm true. I'm more, i would say i'm more responsible than mike <laughs> but um so i've known mike for oh man 30 years or something since we wrestled in college and uh, happened to meet, we, we wrestled for opposing teams actually, but I had a friend that went to Princeton, I went to Columbia. And so we met really early on. And uh, about 10 years after college, when we had started families and such, and we had a lot of small world, world connections. And so we just started hanging out and almost like co-raised our families together in a sense. So we've been on a hundred trips together and have done a lot of uh, different business ventures and friendships and parties and things like that and so um no sooner did mike meet mel than mel and i hit it off like a house on fire that was probably first at J when we went to jackson, jackson hole, hole right yeah, yeah, yeah. so he showed up to jackson hole saw my yeezys was love at first sight and that was that <laughs> right you got to see mel on skis yeah, <laughs> yeah he had a great outfit he was I one of the best looking guys on the mountain but <laughs> Well, the outfit is very important. And, yeah. and since then, we've really, like, we spent a lot of time together, the three of us. Invested in a yeah. lot of stuff together. Um, yeah, and that's kind of been it. So, we, yeah. Mike, let's drill this down a little bit. You came on Market Mondays, and we know that you're a billionaire. You talked about crypto, XRP. We never really got your full story. How does it, where does it start? Like, how did you get to the, what did you, what did you do to get to where you are now? Listen, I was a, uh, a middle class kid. My dad was in the army. I went to Princeton. I was a wrestler. Uh, when I got out of school, I was a helicopter pilot in the army. And then I came to Wall Street and kind of a traditional career. I started at Goldman Sachs. Uh, I was lucky enough to become a partner there when I was pretty young. Uh, then I st helped start a company called Fortress. And Fortress was the first hedge fund private equity company to go public. Mm -hmm. And I did that with kind of Wes Edens, who now owns the Bucks and Pete Brigger. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was fun. That, that's when I really made real money. Uh, left that, you know, had a family office where I started investing in lots of different things. And crypto became kind of the thing. Well, yeah, well, chapter. yeah, what was that? 2015. Mm. And so it was kind of a, a three chapter Wall Street career because they're all variations of the same thing. It's try to understand what's happening in the world and bet on it and then talk about it. Like once you bet on it, you talk about it so people understand what you're betting on. And you can get more people to invest in it. Indeed. Because they're educated and they're more enthusiastic. Why did you switch from stocks to crypto? You know, I was in macro, which is currencies and commodities and stocks. And so it's really understanding the big cultural shifts, the big economic shifts, the big political shifts. And that's what Bitcoin is. So Bitcoin at its essence and crypto at its essence is a macro movement. And so it was very natural. Uh, and I still trade macro. You know, it's and, and, and in five to 10 years, You'll see every trader on Wall Street will, on their screen, they'll have stocks and currencies and the long bond and gold and silver and Bitcoin and Ethereum, just like it's all the same. Mm -hmm. And we already seen that convergence. Mm -hmm. So that, your back, that's your background. Mel, you said you, you invest in a lot of things, right? With, with, with the guys. So your background started in music? Yeah, uh, my background started in music. I. Uh, I started managing acts, trying to get into music. Big fan of uh, Damon Dash, Jay-Z, what they was able to do at Rockefeller as a kid watching them. And I was like, I know I can't rap, so I'll find someone that could sing or rap and manage them. Didn't know how to do that neither, but um, figured it out. 
Started managing, got my first deal with this kid, Giovanni at Atlantic Records. That didn't work out the way I hoped it would, but it got my foot in the door. And then later on, kept managing, found this act, City Morgue. They ended up blowing up. Um, was offered to be the senior vice president of a &R at Republic Records. I took that job. Did that for like five years while running my label, Hikari Ultra. Had a ton of success with the merch business. Um, and that, I, I, I met Mike shortly after that. And I, I never forget, we used to kind of, not kind, we used to sit and go over my finances. And at the time, I, I think I had like, I don't know, like one point something million dollars in cash. And he was like, you have more cash than like a guy that's worth $10 million. And I was like, what? That you had it, you had no it in the bank account? Yeah. And he was like, you need to invest some of this money and just invest it in things that like, don't even think about it again. And it's just, if it comes back, it comes back. And if it don't, whatever, you're broken. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. If it do, you make some money. And, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, I just listened to him. And that's how I kind of looked at investing ever since. Like, I just rather take whatever money I have when I get large chunks of money and put it into something. And some of them came back really great. Some of them I'm still waiting on to come back. Some may never come back. And but I get a lot of opportunities between Mike and Dave yeah. and you know, we'll touch on some of the other things I yeah. did. But that was my start. Music was my start. So the, the financial literacy piece, like you you met the met him yeah. and you start to engage it. Prior to like did you Google who he was and no, I, I just I trust like maybe that down. night when I was like fucking trying to find him. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> but no, I had no idea. So you you said something that was interesting. You said that um, he told you you had more cash than somebody that was worth $10 million. Yeah. I want to talk about that. But first, what did you invest in? Like the S&P 500? You said you invest in safe safe. No, I invested in like a lot of things alongside him. Like, I don't know. Can we say something? Yeah, yeah well, like Whoop, uh, FaZe Clan. Oh, uh, so you just started. You you just went straight to, yeah, <laughs> to investing in companies. To like yeah. private. Bitcoin, I invested in Bitcoin. Forget the, the stock market. Like, you just went straight to the big Yeah, leagues. straight to invest in. At the time, I think I invested in Bitcoin like six grand, like uh, uh, a bio company, like just a bunch of stuff spread out. Like it, So this is like this board. is like one of these weird movies. You meet a random white guy at Meek Mill Party <laughs> that's high. He takes your watch. Three days later, he invites you to his penthouse in Manhattan. You open the door. It's like the Batmobile chamber. And then he, he looks at your portfolio. And he's like, this isn't what you should be doing. You should be investing. And then he tells you to invest in FaZe Clan, Bitcoin, Bunch all of these, of just shit. all kinds yeah. of just random things that just skyrocket. Shout out to Whoop. <laughs> and you're like, yeah, this is like what Eddie Murphy could have been in Trading Places. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah basically, that's so bad. That is so bad. That. And then he came with the blessing of Dave. <laughs> yeah. As Mike is like, Mike as you know, you know, but Dave kind of like, they both keep me kind of like, Mike is like, Shh, and Dave is like, no, come back down here real quick. But Dave is also like a super risk taker. So he, yeah. ba I feel like Dave balances out me and Mike. You know what I'm saying? And like, he's great at investing. He'll tell his story. Yeah. So like, my mindset on investing just kept gro growing and growing and growing. But the one thing I learned from both of them is just take a fucking risk and don't be scared and don't think about the risk after. And how the much reward comes back? How much of that money did you invest? I think maybe all of it. <laughs> one point two yeah. off the table. You, did you have one point two million dollars to your name? Right now? No, at that moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You had yeah. that to your yeah, name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He comes and says, and a watch, and a watch. <laughs> he comes, you, you just meet story. up, and he oh. says, invest. You should, and you invest every single thing you have. Everything. What's going on, y'all? That's right. The biggest event in business is upon us. Invest Fest 2023 is here, August 25th through the 27th, Atlanta, Georgia. Y'all know who's coming, but bigger than that, Shadi, tell them what they're gonna learn. Yes, you will learn about AI. You will learn about crypto. You will learn about stocks. You will learn about real estate. You will learn about merchandise. You will learn about everything you need to know to be a successful entrepreneur and investor. And you will learn from some of the most successful people in the world, billionaires like Robert Smith, billionaires like Michael Novogratz, and so much more. We have Rich Paul, we have Steve Harvey, we have Tabidi Stevens, we have the master investor himself, we have 19 Keys, 
the list goes on. This is going to be an event that you cannot afford to miss. That's right. So head over to investfest.com and get your tickets right now. That's how I always but been. Listen, though. to some degree, because he, he <laughs> Mel was lucky enough or smart enough to have a good income. So he was making money for yeah, his so business. Yeah, so I was making money making for money. making money. So I knew if I, I, knew if if he I wasn't lost burning, all that money, like, it, it was, I would you, make it back in a year. All right. He wasn't burning furniture. Yeah. Right? He, like, this was he, he wasn't going to have to sell. He wasn't like, retired. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, Mike, you said ten guys with $10 million don't have that much money in cash. How much money should how much money should a person have in cash? Again, so much depends on how old you are, what your lifestyle is, and what your income is, right? So if you have no income, like you retire, you better have a bunch of cash because you gotta pay your rent, you gotta pay your car bill, mm -hmm. you gotta have it, you know, incidental expenses. But if you know you're making a hundred thousand a month, right, you pretty much can cover anything you, you need to to yeah. deal with. So yeah. you can you can really run your investment portfolio with low cash and high risk. Yeah. And so, so much is your, a, your personal risk tolerance and your opportunity set. What I, what I realized, and one of the things that I wanted to, to kind of experiment with in some ways, I mean, it wasn't a mental experiment, but there's not a ton of black wealth, period, right? 13% of the population, 1.5% of the wealth in this country. Until that changes, our country's kind of broken. And one of the ways you create wealth is network. Right, Mel is a stunningly good networker. You put him in any room and everyone likes him. Sure. I don't know if it's his big smile or uh, <laughs> dopey face, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> and so, you know, he he went to the Milken Conference. Next thing you know, he's going to Saudi Arabia, he's in the Middle East, and you know, he's friends with everybody. He met you guys, right? So that ability to network, well, if you grow up in a bad zip code, hey, you're networking with, you know, people that are, aren't creating a lot of wealth. You put him in a room with, wealth creators, he's going to network and get opportunities. And so now he's bringing more opportunities to Dave and I than we're bringing to him. <laughs> and, and so a little bit is guidance, a little bit is just introducing people to the networks of money, right? How do you raise capital? How do you find ideas? How do you use your political connections to get stuff done? All of that process uh, that lots of people that don't grow up with that never have access to. And that's a little bit the idea of the podcast. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah. Like, so we, we got your story. Yeah. We got my story. Dave, we got we got to get your story. So I, I know you said Columbia. Yeah. But your background is in developing real estate, right? Primarily. Yeah. So right. so like, explain to the people how, how you've come to, to prowess yeah. at, at this level. Yeah, you got it. So um, I was uh, I went to Columbia. I was a wrestler there. Um, that was a big part of my life. I went to law school afterwards to Georgetown and um, actually pra passed the bar in New York, New Jersey and practiced law for about three years in New York. Um, and, you know, learned what I had to from that. It was, I think it was a really good base for understanding contracts, how to communicate clearly and things like that. And from that, um, went with my brother into real estate in the, let's say like early mid nineties. Um, my father had done development of affordable housing kind of real estate. So I was, I was schooled, had a little bit of background in it and, um, <clears throat> you know, understood some things and, and, and that was a really good time to start investing in real estate back. That was one of those times like we're almost in now. Mm -hmm. So we started with apartments, um, in North Jersey, moved from there to the city. We got into hotels, um, in say early two thousands, W standard, uh, Chiltern Firehouse came after that. And, re and really at that point in time, as I started broadening my investments, started looking into technology, um, f other food and beverage and hospitality platforms, uh, biotech at this point in time, you know, mushrooms, crypto. And so like, in a sense, <clears throat> I've been entrepreneurial the whole time. And if really, um, I know you guys, you guys had had uh, Steve Harvey on once and I watched the thing and he had like these five rules and I thought they were pretty interesting, mm -hmm. right? I think mm -hmm. you had said something about it and it was dream big, have imagination, um, be great, gratitude, yeah. right? Don't fear, you know, control your fear mm -hmm. and then have faith that it's going to work out. And I think that's really what like Good entre memory. entrepreneurism is about. And that's really how I've been living my life in a sense, in, in, in a business sense of like pushing into things, even when I was uncomfortable using, you know, I didn't use exactly those five mantras, but, but essentially effectively doing that. And mm -hmm. so that's what really allowed me to push in and, and just bring 
<clears throat> so many opportunities, you know? So when I got involved with, for instance, Catch with Mark and Eugene and, and you know, one of their kind of like founding investors in that, it was really because I'd put them in an opportunity earlier in the W Hotel before they had started. And so it's that kind of thing that's always served me well in life, you know? Same thing with Mel and, uh, you know, ma many people, Mike and I, and we just kind of create this network. And and so it's, I guess it's it's real estate would be a big portion of what, for sure, what I do and what I focus on, but I do have a bunch of other venture investments that I also pursue. Yeah, I want to personally thank you for Catch. <laughs> my, like, it's my it's my favorite restaurant. It's my kids' favorite restaurant. Yeah, I heard you say that. Like, you know, like when I left here today, my daughter was like, uh, "I said, what do you want to do today?" She's like, "Can we go to Catch?" Uh, I was like, "Interesting enough, I I might know a guy." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we can get your table. Well, that's that's all that's all kudos and uh, gratitude to Eugene Ram and Mark Birnbaum because it was really their entire brainchild and execution. But I was happy to be a part of it. So and this is how Larry gets hooked up with Catch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This. I hooked him up with Catch. Okay. Yeah, because when the first time I met Larry, <clears throat> excuse me, um, we started talking. He started talking about restaurants, and I just happened to dr drop that name, and he was like, oh, "That's my favorite restaurant," you, could, you know. And, there, and then I was like, "Oh, I could definitely yeah, we had dinner make in my that house. happen." <laughs> and then about a month and a half, two months later, we had dinner in Mike's house, and that's where that started. So, all right, what, what do you guys look for when you in, are investing in these type of investments? Because we talk about stocks, that's relatively kind of easy to figure out. Mm -hmm. I don't want to say easy. You know, when you're doing private companies, it's a lot more variables that go into play. You got to yeah. wait a lot longer. Yes. It's a lot lower chance that it's even going to work out. Yeah. So what's the thought process? Well, there's a whole, I would say there's a whole spectrum there, right? Like one of the big investments I have was in Bojangles and that was less risky, right? Bojangles is an iconic brand uh, in the South, fried chicken. Uh, you know, the company needed a little bit of management shuffle, needed to cut some expenses, and needed to expand. Uh, and so you put money in that and you think over the four or five year cycle, uh, you're gonna you're gonna get 20, 20 plus percent returns and then sell it out five to 10 years later, or maybe not, uh, if you can keep building it. So that's kind of a, I would say a safer private investment, mm -hmm. something like the whoop band, which measures heart rate variability, which all the athletes wear, right? It measures your sleep and how good a sleep you get. <clears throat> When I invested in that, it was a kid across the street came over and said, hey, you know, I played squash at Harvard. I'm doing this thing. You know, so you put 100 grand in to start, then it starts doing well and you start putting more money in. And so that venture stuff, smaller bets, you know, a little bit of a yo, you know, like Atlantic City, you're hoping for the 11. Mm -hmm. uh, you better have trust the entrepreneur. He better be dynamic and be able to pivot if shit goes wrong. And you better have a pretty good idea that you're in the right space. Yeah. And those things are, you know, one in three work, maybe one in, if you're great, one in three work, if you're average, one in 10 work. Uh, but it, but it starts out with like, to sum up, right? It's like good people, right? Somebody you trust that's going to execute this. That's how I look at it mm -hmm. is, is, is this person going to put their all into it? Are they honest? Are they hardworking? Are they giving their everything to it? And then second with the business model, is it really something like in a space where if they do what they say, it's actually like a business with moats and defensible product, right? Where it's not going to just be something that 10 other competitors can just shave the margin. So is there something a little bit unique about yeah. but it? But this comes say. also back to network and, and, and just how privileged you are to have a good network and how you, I, I was with my interns yesterday. And I was like, dude, you guys got to work and build your network. All these people that you just finished this internship class with, stay in touch with. The people you worked with, stay in touch with. Because over time, some are going to become stars and successes. And those guys are going to give you opportunities. We think of, like Dave and I were, were the first capital, day one investors in Peloton. Uh, and, you know, we put a decent small, you know, check, a venture check in. It was probably two, three hundred thousand dollars $300,000 each. And at one point, that $300,000 was worth over $100 million. Uh, oh, the two, uh, $200,000 that you invested... At one point, it was worth a hundred million. Yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, two months before it crashed. I invested. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> you invested. I mean, so after the IPO, it went up to one hundred forty nine dollars. Yeah, yeah, that's right. and so that that made that. Yeah, that's so again, tie yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> so if we went over my financials two months earlier, yeah. I'd have got in right there and made. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the the interesting thing on something like Peloton is, you know. We met the guy through a school connection. He came and sought us out because he knew we had capital. Dave and another friend of ours, Dave Heller, they actually did the work and joined the board and helped him build the company. I was a free rider. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
you know, it was a small investment to start with. Next thing you know, it was significant capital for anybody. Yeah. And so, again, it's a little bit what I was talking about with Mel going to the, the Milken thing. Most people don't have networks. <clears throat> and so working and developing your network, getting into networks where you see opportunity is a good chunk of how people succeed. Yeah, so, so Dave, there's a part there when we talk about moats, because you said that, and that's something we talk about with our audience a lot, is finding the competitive advantage that separates you. So when you're looking at a, a company like Peloton, for I mean, use that example, like what moats are you looking for specifically inside of a company? Yeah, at, at that time, what what I was really looking at, you know, I'd, I'd known John Foley and had a lot of faith in him. He was a really great entrepreneur. and stationary it was really like the stationary bike and home fitness market at that time had nothing that was blending it really into like the internet and the digital culture and technology that was coming and so i think what i saw there was was first mover advantage in a sense. And if he could create a little bit of a network effect with his bikes and with that programming, that that would be its moat in a sense, right? Because it was something that other people tried to compete with some successfully, the mirror, for instance, or mm -hmm. tonal, mm -hmm. or, and others had, had tried and failed. But I think by having first mover advantage and what, what happened there was interesting was he, we had to go on hyper speed because we had this problem where the delivery from China, Taiwan actually was taking too long. And so like, three months after we had raised the first round, it was like, we need another round because we have to be able to purchase these things in advance because nobody's going to wait 180 days. So I think the moat there really was getting ahead of that market, having first mover advantage, essentially. Okay. And so it, I wonder when you're looking at the investment, obviously at its peak, it's at $149. It's come down to like $9 now. Yeah. At, at a certain point that we have a discussion like guys, Oh, yeah. We might want to pull out of the investment. Like, yeah. how, how does that go? This is really interesting, actually. And this is, M Mike and I had a lot of conversations about, a lot of conversations <laughs> about this. So what, what happened with Peloton was he actually, Mike's, you know, he's a macro trader. So when he is more, I would say, inclined to, at certain points, lock a profit, take it off the table. You know, for me as an entrepreneur, I wrote it more part of my position longer than Mike. And it was really interesting because there was times for sure in the beginning when he was like, God damn it, why did I move so much of that? Because, you know, he moved it yeah. when- It was still like at 70 when still, it was still going up. Oh, no, so I, it, it was, it, when people ask me, what was the yeah. worst trade of my career? Oh. Yeah. I had hired a new CIO. <laughs> and I said, what do you think about this Peloton? It had, our 300,000 words were 7 million at the time. And he was like, dude, it's a freaking bike. And he did a 21 page report that said I should sell it. And I was like, and I was making lots of money in other things. And I was like, I, you know, I've never had a 20 to one venture bet. It was my first one. I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll just sell it. And Dave and Dave Heller said, dude, don't sell it. Maybe take your basis off, but this thing's going to take off. And I didn't want to disappoint the new guy. I was busy with Ethereum and I sold the damn thing. All of it? All of it, like an idiot. And <laughs> certainly <laughs> then that's that seven million that I would have made would have been like worth 150 million at one uh -huh. point. And I was just watched and watched it. But <laughs> yeah. when it, so when it started getting high, I was yelling at him. I was like, dude, you got to take some profit at one point. Yeah. And so I was, and he was like, yeah, yeah, Mr. $7. The, <laughs> yeah, no, but I, I was, and, and Mike was just on me and this is the, you know, the power of that friendship. And he was like, look, trust me, I've seen this movie. And so when it started getting into 60, 70 in that range on the way up, not the way, you know, I was like peeling it off, peeling it off, peeling it off. I was doing some other strategies where I was um, selling call options uh, to like kind of lock in. And then depending on if, if it hit that, I'd, I'd uh, you know, release the stock or whatever. And so I sold a lot of mine in that time, like uh, between like 60 and 100 or something. And which even that was funny because when that thing, as you correctly pointed out, I think it had a high of like 150. And I was like, Mike, what the hell? <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it didn't, it didn't try our friendship, but there was the first, yeah. Dave's been mad at me like twice in life. Once when I lost our, not one of them. once I lost our two 10 year old kids in the middle of uh, Cape Town, Cape South Town. Africa, was uh, probably uh, yeah. for three hours. And I, I was like, oh my God, Dave's actually mad. I know the wives are going to be mad at me, but when Dave got mad at me, I knew I was like, oh, I'm screwed. I'm screwed. <laughs> <laughs> and the other one was like a passive aggressive. When Peloton was at 150 and I've been telling him at 60 and 70 and 80 and 90, I just sell more, sell more, sell more. And when it was at like but, 140, he was like, like but to be, just, but to be fair, up. it ended up really, you know, really that mentality and, and bleeding that out. I mean, I was done with 80% 80, 80 of my position in that range. And so then I could just ride the last 20, you know, really up and down to, you know, I think I sold my last bit at 15 or 18 or something. It's eight or nine now.
Yeah. You know, but it probably, when you when he looks back on it, with an average price of 70, having bought it at one, you know, it's probably the best, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, $100 million oh, yeah. investment off a $300,000. Yeah. yeah. So you, you, still, you, you, still you, get, you get a couple of those in your life. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking yeah. to my, I, when I'm like, wow, $1 investment. I mean, $200,000 investment. Because I watched that. We have friends who were investing in it and they bought call options and yeah. they believed in it. Believed. I'm like, uh, I'm trying to figure out what the mode is, right? Because if yeah. somebody designs a bike, that yeah. can be competitive, it's tough. The, the thing you have to be careful mm -hmm. with is, so I was just on a show and was asked, what's the best investment advice you ever got? And it's that great fortunes are made in trend. So if you bought Microsoft, you just stayed with it because they had such a moat, they have a monopoly and it just goes and goes and goes and smart people. So on the one hand, great fortunes are made in trend. On the other hand, markets are fiery and full of anxiety and, and, and excitement. We have these bubbles from time to time, right? right? Crypto is a, is a market that's prone to that. So in 2017, there was an amazing bubble, then it crashed 95%. And then there was another bubble in 2021. Uh, Peloton had its explosion based on the COVID bubble. Mm -hmm. Everyone's gonna stay home and never leave again, and they're all gonna exercise in their ba bathrooms, right? <laughs> and so the insanity of price so you've yeah. got to look at both, do these companies have a mobile? When prices get insane, you've yeah. just got to, get, you got to go to the sideline and say, I'm not going to have the top. I had an amazing run. I'm done. Uh, and, I, you know, beyond me. I, you, can, I, you can have any of these fatty things yeah. that happened. You can, you've got to be able to sell. <clears throat> yeah. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, I was just going to really quick say, I think the moat for Peloton, though, was it was a opportunity that where nobody was yet and if you could successfully execute first mover advantage to a scale you started to get network effect which they did with their trainers because they could peel all the best trainers because they had such a distribution platform so equinox for instance couldn't compete with them mm -hmm. and that business just like music you know people follow trainers right a good trainer so that i think was what the moat was yeah. in a sense and i, I think see. uh what mike said I, I kind of bought it over from the music industry. And then when I heard Mike and Dave always tell me, like, don't get too emotionally attached to investment. And I used to do that with music all the time. Like, you know, the, the first artist I had, like, no one couldn't tell me this kid was going to be wasn't going to be Justin Bieber. Right. And he's an amazingly talented kid still doing his thing to this day. But in my mind, he was Justin Bieber and the rest of the world Bieber, just Bieber? didn't Bieber. Yeah. <laughs> I always say that wrong. And the rest of the world just didn't get it yet. So I yeah, held on with beeps. this kid for five, six, seven years. Just, just like, yeah. you guys don't know. You guys don't know. And it turned out he wasn't right. Mm -hmm. But so, but I, that was just more me being emotionally attached to it and investing so much already. It's kind of like, when you're in the casino chasing that loss, trying to win it back, right? Mm -hmm. So I think with investing, I've learned like to, when it's time to, one, just not to be emotionally attached to it and learn to cut your ties with it whenever the time is right or you feel it's right and not like hold on and Peloton's gonna go to $200. Yeah. Cause, you, know, you try to you try to rationalize things to make yourself not feel stupid. Yeah, yeah. it's like, well, I did the research. This has to work. Yeah, it's just a slump in the economy. I'm gonna buy the dip. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and then buy more dip, and then might buy more dips, and then it's like, yeah. well, you know, I'm looking at the charts. Then you start doing candlesticks, yeah. and you start making your own philosophy like, on why it's like gonna Tesla's work. Like is another oh, great, story great story that I just found out about this recently. So when I we started investing. Mike was like betting against Tesla, right? And on the downside, so was I. I, yeah, yeah. He, he was too. They both were. Shorten it. Win, win. Sh Shorten at it. what like, point in time? At when was that? During the pandemic? It was. No, it was pre pandemic. Pre pandemic. Not, let me tell you, it was not a good time to be short. No, no, <laughs> it was, no, no it, it was. Story it was during, I think it was during the pandemic. I think it was the summer of twenty. When it moved from like, and it was just going crazy. Yeah, it was moving. It moved at that time. I, I want to say from like four hundred to a thousand. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah, like sure. in that kind of pandemic. Zone. I think yeah. I and, bet against it with one of our friends and lost like eighty thousand. Can, can i tell the story yeah, yeah like, okay. this is really crazy so we mike and i have been shorting it and playing it and shorting it like and buying and selling just, buying and selling just, and one day we come up to the hamptons mel's in the car and we pull up to mike's house and he looks at the driveway and he goes damn for 
few guys, a couple of guys short Tesla. There sure are a lot of Teslas in this driveway. <laughs> I was like, I ping, and I sold all my, I covered all my stuff the next I day. I never stuff to messed like with it again. Because I'm like, this guy's right. Like, we're all driving Teslas. Like, what am I doing? <laughs> I'm listening to some like investment advice I saw on like, you know, CNBC or whatever. And meanwhile, the, you know, and it kept going up. So yeah. It was it was a really interesting lesson. Yeah, I mean, it's dope even at the highest levels that y'all are. Some of the same things you're saying, like we're experiencing. Yeah. So, but you, but you didn't give up on music, right? Which is because nah, we, we just had this conversation with well, Yo Gotti and Shadi was talking about like, yo, investing is, is the same thing as like getting a musical artist. Like you're putting the money up front yeah. and looking at it as investment. So it's interesting to hear you say you're not getting emotionally tied to it. So, so recently, like uh, again great advice from Mike and Dave. Like recently, um, I got into uh, affordable housing and Mike is a part of it. Uh, one of my closest friends, Stephen Manicharan and his brother, we have this company where we're doing affordable housing, got some uh, buildings in the Bronx. Uh, Dave was helping us with a property in Staten Island, so on and so forth. And I was just kind of like, like Mike said, all these opportunities was coming. My head was just spinning. I was like, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do this. And Mike kind of was like, listen, and Dave actually, both was kind of like, figure out a couple things, focus on those. And Mike specifically said, don't be like Mike, who two years ago, I was just doing way too much. And I was like, fuck. That's good advice. So I kind of like trimmed down everything and focused on three big things, which is uh, my record label, Second Estate. Shout out to Two Rare and anybody else I signed on the records. Shout out to um, Clean Lineup. Bojangles, which is my company, Mel and Bo, mm -hmm. um, and real estate. And I was like, those are the three things I'm going to focus on on a high level and stop like, uh, you know, selling Wagyu beef here and this, that, that, and whatever else it was. But I'm still like investing in things. I, I just built a studio. Um, my merch business does really well. Like, so it's just like, still have things to bring me in cash. And, but I'm focused on those three buckets in life. And like- I, One of the things that's important, especially when you're younger, is to develop domain expertise. Like we were at the the, 50 Cent concert last night and he kept bringing people on. And I was like, who is that guy? And of course, Mel knows every last person <laughs> showing up there and what their songs were and, you know, how, are they in the upper, are they in the down? And so you're not going to really be great at a vertical unless you've got domain expertise. And so you'd be crazy to spend your whole life in music and say, I'm not doing music anymore, right when you're starting to make the progress in music. And so, you know, knock on wood, second the state becomes you know, the next uh, quality control. Yeah, quality yeah. control. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, the, shout out Coach K. Yeah, I was going to say the, the, the relationship with Coach K because well, he's involved in the Bojangles investment as well. Yeah. So you had the relationship with him and brought him on. Oh, so, yeah. Game. After Mike, uh, Mike and Dave actually bought Bojangles from like a whatever standpoint. Um, the brand. The yeah. brand, the actual corporate brand. I was like, you know what? I'm going to get into Bojangles. And I just kind of wanted to. One, there's a group of people who have access to even people like me now, right? Because I'm like, to have access to me now, it means a little something because I could give you access. Like Larry, I bought Larry and introduced him to Mike, Dave, and whoever else. I'm I'm the type of person, like, I'm like excited to share my network with people because I strongly believe whatever's for you is going to be for you. So like, if you guys left here, tomorrow and started a group chat. I'm okay with that because I want you to have access to them. I want them to have access to you. And mm -hmm. we're still gonna be friends, do our thing. A lot of people don't understand that and it fucks with them. So when I had the opportunity for Bojangles, I was kind of like, I wanna bring some of my friends on board who probably wouldn't have this opportunity, just like I wouldn't have it if it wasn't for these guys. So I you know, called up Coach K, I was like, hey, I'm doing this. I'm buying 18 stores. It's going to make us like the largest black franchise or at Bojangles and just QSR in general. I think we're like in the top 20, right? Mm -hmm. And we're the fifth largest franchise or in Bojangles. And I called up him, uh, Steve Carlos, Saint, Lonre Gabba. Um, if I'm forgetting anybody, sorry. But, you know, just like a cool little group, you know, along with, 
Ben, uh, Black, Mike, Dave Barry, and we bought this uh, we bought this company for twenty five million dollars. And you know, just it's my company along with Coach K, but I wanted to extend that to everyone and coach k is he's one of us now you know what i'm saying larry like larry's gotten larry and dave is actually closer than me and larry now you know what i'm saying so it's just like i love like what my success i've always said is people people yeah. believing in me and people me understanding people so i'm always like it's where we come from like you know what i'm saying it's really hard to like meet guys like this or have certain opportunities. And when some people get it, they're like, oh, this is like, I don't want to. And I'm not like, I'm the complete yeah. opposite. I want everyone like, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. what comes out, are, you gonna, are you going to live no. life from a point of abundance yeah. or from scarcity? Yeah. Mm. And you're just happier when you live from abundance. Yeah. Mel, Mel is one of the most generous person people I've ever met in that, in that capacity. He's so generous with his time, with sharing his contacts, with helping in any way. And I think it's a really, I think it's unusually, he's unusually generous and it really works. It really is like, you know, it kind of pays it forward and he gets lots of opportunities, but I think it's a big part of his success is really that enthusiasm and generosity. Yeah. So Mike, you said something interesting. You said, Mel's now bringing more deals to us than we brought to him. <laughs> so I'm like, Mel, when, when you present, I'm sure people are presenting opportunities to you now. It's like, yeah. I know he's connected. So how do you decipher what's worthy of even presenting to, to, to the group? Believe it or not, like, I've learned so much that I could understand, like, you know, like he said, who's the founder, you know, what he's done before, just how much I actually believe in that person. And I like to think I just have a good read on people and what they truly stand for. And that's always took me places in my life, right? Because just like these guys, they're good guys. And Steven is a good guy, Ben Black. Like I, 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 I truly believe my crew of friends, David Offa is really good people who we have, we are, we're very much aligned in just life and then there's another group of people that I've, I, I have tons of access to that I just can't function with on an everyday basis because mm -hmm. uh, goals and hearts and minds and souls are just aren't aligned. So I try to, and I think that gets a little bit emotional, but it's just like, I try to read people and understand people. And I, I would like to say I'm pretty decent at that. And that's the ones I'm like, you know, we should take a look at this. One, it sounds like a great idea. Two, I kind of believe in this person. And then he would vet it and then Dave would vet it. And, you know, they, they're both so different at vetting things, but it ends up the same all the time. So that's kind of like, I don't know if I answered your question, but that's, that's, that's how I kind of like gauge. Mm -hmm. so it's a lot of shit I just don't even bring up, you know? Yeah. yeah. Let me ask you guys. Start with you, Mike. Um, artificial intelligence. When the age of artificial intelligence, we saw all of the AI stocks and technology stocks just boom because of chat GBT, the buzz around and everything. A lot of people are concerned, scared. You know, jobs are being lost currently. Uh, so there's, there's downside, but there's also a lot of upside as well. What's your thoughts on AI? How are you actually implementing? How are you personally using artificial yeah, intelligence? So, I want all you guys' opinions. So it's interesting. My... Uh my brother-in-law runs the TED conference. And so the day, the first day Chat GPT came out, he was like, dude, you gotta see this. And so we start playing with it and making, you know, do a Saturday Night Live sketch about, Saturday Night Live sketch about somebody. And, you know, we're kind of running through that kind of deal with it. And I started talking to my investing friends and in real quick, it was Microsoft and NVIDIA. Those were gonna be the two. And so it was almost consensus. It's one of those few things where every smart guy I talked to gave you the same answer. Mm. And they've worked. And so I would tell you that AI is gonna be a bubble. Bubbles happen around things that will change the way the world operates. And so the internet bubble happened in 1999, 10 years before the internet changed the world, because it was clear that it was gonna change the world, that it was an easy story for people to understand. And so we will have an AI bubble. Bubbles don't last four months. They last 18 months, 12 months, you know, 16 months, somewhere in that zone, 12 to 18 months. And so what's driving the stock market now is a small group <clears> of stocks, <throat> NVIDIA, Microsoft, Google, that are going to keep going higher because 
the story's too powerful. So that's, the markets are gonna get way ahead of where AI gets. In reality, AI is gonna change the world. It's gonna change how almost every business operates. And it already has. You know, I talked to the biggest hedge fund, quantitative hedge fund in the world, the CTO. Uh, it was funny, he showed up at a party of mine and I was like, hey, what are you doing? He's like, I'm a head of engineering at this hedge fund. And I was like, how many people do you have working for you? He's like, a thousand. I was like, oh, that hedge fund, <laughs> right? Uh, and I was asked him about AI. He said, dude, we've been using AI for, 15, or for 10 years. You know, this new generation, this new ad adaption is gonna really accelerate them. And, and it was interesting, he said, well, it's gonna accelerate that when you have these code-driven funds, right, these quantitative funds, the code kind of goes stale every three to four years because you're changing the language. And he said, so they're now gonna use AI to refresh the code. It'll do it literally at six times the speed that they used to do it at. And so saves them money, keeps them ahead of the game. And so in finance, you're gonna see more AI, but in almost every business. And you know it's a scary world because you can see ourselves going more haves and have nots, right? It's, I always worry that the, the world is hurtling towards Blade Runner, right? Mm. Kinshasa Zaire has 14 million people that live without electricity. Yet we're talking about, hey, can I get a, a iPhone that sounds like her that can you know keep me company at night? <laughs> uh, and so, it's, I think it's gonna be really fascinating to watch. Uh, it's gonna be challenging to invest because some companies you know, are gonna not have a moat and AI is gonna eat them alive and other companies are gonna have. Well, the one thing about AI which is hard is it takes a huge amount of money, right? To get these long, language, large language learning processing. So it's data, it's huge compute power. And so it's hard to be a startup, yeah. right? Like the startups are raising billions. Yeah, but one thing about you mentioned the stock market, the Nasdaq was flat for ten years, dot com bubble, the 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 stock market crash. So you said that the, those stocks will continue to go up. You don't think that a bubble would cause the stock market to fall? It goes first. The bubble goes up first and then crashes. And but I don't the, think we we we've, we've seen the high yet. But the stock market eventually will catch up to the crash. Yeah, this, 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 you're gonna you're gonna. What happens in every bubble is you finally reach the point where there's no one left to buy. And it usually happens around something symbolic. Like the great 2000 you know, crash happened around the Y2K, right? The millennium turn. There was champagne being popped around the world. There was fireworks that went off 24 hours, right? From Sydney. Remember this great, we went mm -hmm. from 1999 to 2000. The Dow Jones peaked January 1. And the, the NASDAQ had... 62 more days, it was like March 20th or March 19th, uh, where, where the Dow was going down and the Nasdaq that kept going up and then it crashed. And it crashed with AOL Time Warner, the symbolic, the big old old school company buying the internet company at a stupid price. Mm. That was the last money in. And then we had an 82% crash of the Nasdaq. Not an 18% crash, 82% high to low. And so bubbles, mm go so much further than you think they're gonna go, and then they crash all the way back down. And so we're not there yet. Yeah. We're gonna go a lot higher in NVIDIA and in Microsoft and in this, this idea of the world's gonna change. Yeah. Uh, Cause we just started it, right? We started talking about this four months ago. <laughs> yeah, inside of the AI, that's interesting. And Dave, I wanna hear, and I wanna hear both of you guys' opinion on AI, but inside of that, it's like, um, there are companies that are here, you talked about too, NVIDIA, Microsoft, but inside of a bubble, there are always some that are gonna survive the bubble and they last longer, right? Yeah. So like there's the Amazon, there's the Apple, there's the Yahoo for it, but there's also the excite.com that doesn't make it, Yeah. right? And so I, I wonder if you, if you think there are companies that are on the come up or there's startups that will come out of this bubble. I'm sure that, I'm sure you, you have some thoughts on that or should we be looking at it from a different perspective? You said something very important. This takes a lot of energy, it takes a lot of capital, but it also takes a lot of storage. So are, should we be looking in that data center type of situation where like these are investments we should be looking at as well? 
Earners, what's going on? Listen, EYLU is relaunching, revamping, retooling. That's right, we're creating a new educational experience that's more expansive. Shari, tell them what we got. Yes, 2023. We got a lot in store, a lot planned for you guys. So you know that EYLU already includes monthly financial planning calls with me, book club calls with Troy, real estate calls with MG the Mortgage Guy, access to the home buying blueprint, volume one and volume two. Part of the revamp will include 27 local chapters from across the United States, live interactive teaching, hands-on, not just pre-recorded videos, plus 15 brand new curriculums. The biggest just got bigger. Yeah, listen, so we have a data center business at Galaxy and, we're, and it's been mostly for Bitcoin mining. We're like, okay, can we repurpose the other 600 megawatts of capacity? Um, and who's gonna use those data centers, right? So like, you know, the, the elite businesses are gonna stay with the elite data centers because they're not gonna take any risk, but there's a whole bunch of different users of AI, of, of data. And so the answer is yes, but it's really granular and you got to kind of do your homework and there's not a macro bet on it. I don't mm -hmm. think mm -hmm. just say buy all the data centers. I think you got to be very careful to understand which ones are going to win. So you're getting it with Amazon because you you know, the, the, the big cloud the providers mm -hmm. already have it. And so you're getting it with Amazon, you're getting it with Google, getting it with Microsoft. Uh, it's why those damn stocks just keep going. So I, I wanted you to talk because you you didn't you look like you was about to say something, but you didn't have an no. opportunity to say something. Well, it, just in AI, I was I was gonna just say that I think it's also like a term that's batted around in this way that it's like, what really is AI? Because AI to me really is like machine learning, where machines are teaching. It, you know, a lot of what masks it as AI in some ways is just like complex algorithms attached to the large language model, right? But it's I think we're still a ways away from like. I, I don't know where the definition of AI or the singularity actually becomes, right? Where it's actually thinking, making decisions, teaching itself and how far away we are. I, I do think just to, you know, it's, it's a pretty scary proposition because I think it needs more ethical thought and moral thought around where it's going. I think as a society, it's too easy for us to just build atom bombs and then, oh shit, one goes off or, you know, and so I think there's a lot of danger around it. I, I, you know, Hariri wrote um, Sapiens and also had something like 23 lessons for the 21st century and, and some books. And in, in that, like his theory is the industrial revolution replaced bodies and now the intelligence or digital revolution culminating ultimately with AI is going to replace minds, right? And so in the industrial revolution, those jobs got replaced by programming jobs or the people that make the machines and things like that. And then, you know, kind of where's the next thing if the, so I think it's, it, I think there's a lot of, lot to think about. I'm not answering from an investment standpoint as much as just, and you know, for my personal company, I just look at like, is it in a spot right now where in the foreseeable future, it's gonna leverage a business return for me? It's gonna either have less friction, more market, or how am I applying it to the business in a way that's meaningful and not just like, oh, let's just you know kind of put this new program in. And But it, it, it's hard not to think yeah. that in 10 years, every kid will have an AI tutor, right? Like if you're rich, real rich, you hire a tutor for your kid and he comes over to your house for like two hours a night or an hour, two hours a week and he sits with your kid and he figures out where your kid is and what 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 he needs. Like that's gonna get replaced by AI. And they're, yeah. they're, then the kids that grow up in Flatbush, maybe will have the same access to great education than the kids that grow up on the Upper East Side. Yeah. Like, De it hasn't happened yet. Devil's advocate though, when COVID came, I, I know it's not AI, but people started computer learning and scores went down. Could we have it? Could we, 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 we we haven't perfected or even gotten close to tutoring. Yeah. So um, my my experience with AI is funny because like, I don't know very much about it. I, I'm just like no one, no one really, I mean, there's probably a couple of guys that knows a lot about it, but I was uh, in the process, literally when I built that studio, a part of the reason for building that studio was because I wanted to start a publishing company. I was going to raise like four or five million dollars to start this publishing company. And the AI talk started happening right around then. And a publishing company, you 
primarily like sign producers, songwriters, you know, you may sign an artist and it's publishing, right? But you make your money from producers and songwriters. And I was like, you know what? I'm like connected in every label I'll be able to play this. and I had this great blueprint. And then I heard songs that AI wrote, right? Like the Drake, the weekend song. I'm mm -hmm. sure you guys heard that. I heard beats they produce and I was like, fuck, I don't know if I'm right about this, but I don't want to spend four or five million dollars building up a business for the next because publishing takes about three years before you hit that cycle. If you if you do it completely right, right, where money's coming in. And I just didn't know where AI would be in the music industry three years from now. Maybe AI is writing all songs and then there's no need for me to sign they bury to write songs anymore, right? So I'm like, do I take a risk right now of developing and starting a new business based on like humans, right? That I'm realizing the very beginning stages of AI, they're doing it really, really well. And maybe three years from now, AI is writing songs for Beyonce or songs for, you know, uh, whoever producing beats for Drake. And I don't have the technology. And like he said, it's a lot of money to do that. So I'd literally completely stepped back from that business and, and uh, decided to just focus on real estate, uh, Bojangles and um, music. And just traditionally, like from a label perspective, because not because I knew it was just a gut feeling. And I'm just like, you know what, instead of like, using all this money to do something I'm already unsure about. Now this AI thing put me in a position where I just want to kind of wait and see what happens. And I, I won't revisit that business. It's just kind of passed for me at this point. But that was my experience with AI recently. And again, hopefully I'm wrong because like you said, that will cost so many jobs, so many songwriters, producers out of work, which is 50% of the music business. But from a label perspective, if I had to pay and I'm just making this up, if I had to pay Timbaland uh, $200,000 for a beat and I could tell AI, hey, I need a beat that sounds like Timbaland and it cost me a frack, it don't even cost me anything because I already paid for the program, right? It's more cost effective. As the label, <laughs> I'm going to go with that AI. So I'm, I'm, I looked at it from both perspectives and I just decided to completely back away. Interesting. Right. Right. Well, appreciate you guys. I know you got to run. How can they watch the podcast? When will the podcast be available? Dave Barry could answer that. <laughs> Pass it back to you. Yeah. No, we uh, we're we're shooting. We have like four. We're only doing seasons. Okay. You, you know, we're yeah. doing twelve episodes each season, and uh, we have like maybe five done. We're gonna finish up in September. And we'll be sure to let you guys know when, where, how. But it will be coming. We'll, we'll, yell, we'll yell and scream. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, guys, guys, thanks a ton. End of September. Thank, right? End of September, yeah. yeah. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. This was a really insightful conversation. So. It was a great one. Thank, Thank you. Look forward to seeing yeah. you guys. I really enjoyed it. Thank sure. you, guys. Yeah. Really and awesome. you guys will be on our shit. Yeah, sure. Man. All right.